Uh, Join with me to Proverbs 3, 6 to 12, a very famous passage in Proverbs, but it's going to be a fun uh, time getting into the Word of God together. Uh, Poke your neighbor and say it's going to be fun. Nudge your neighbor even harder, the other neighbor, and just say it's going to be even funner because I'm sitting next to you. (laughs) All right, Proverbs 3 reads this. It says, in everything you do, put God first. Everybody say, put God first. Say it louder. Put God first. Amen. And he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Don't be conceited. Sure of your own wisdom. Instead, trust and reverence the Lord and turn your back on evil. When you do that, then you will be given renewed health and vitality. You will be given renewed health and vitality. If you're taking notes, the title of today's message is God Will Not Be Second. God will not be second. So, Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, we come with, uh, Lord, with just God-fearing trembling when it comes to your word. We honor it. Lord, we cherish your word. This is the absolute, undiluted word of God. This is infallible. It's powerful, all-powerful. And we thank you, Father, Lord, that everything in your word is yes and amen. And we thank you for what you're doing in our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. I want to do some teaching today. But uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very competitive. Uh, I love competition. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate being uh, a part of the Ramsey family because the Ramsey family is far more competitive than what I am. And so I typically lose at everything that I do uh, when it comes to my wife. Even uh, we have, we've got a, a card war that we that gone. There's a certain game of golf that we do. And my wife, like we, we, we said, when we started, when we were married, when we started, we, we took notes on every time she won compared to when I won. And I'm always coming in second. It's just, it really, it's a sting. It's like for a husband, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I'm always coming in second. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Uh, growing up in school, I loved doing uh, track and field, so I loved doing the short runs, but I really liked doing the long distance runs. But there was just that one friend, just one friend that always beat me no matter what. Just that one guy, I don't know if you had that one guy or that one girl in your competitions, but just that one guy that left that sting of second place. Because our, our generation is trying to teach kids it's not about trophy. It is about winning. It is about competition. It is about being number one. It is being about first. I was having this conversation with men, and it's like uh, at the Forge night, and it's like, you know, coming in third, you're like, yes, I got a medal. I'm good to go. This is amazing. I actually got into the winning ceremony. This is amazing. But coming in second, it's that sense of I got a medal, but I almost won. I was just there. I almost got across the finish line first. And I was thinking about this, and I wonder how God feels when we place him second in our lives. Because each and every one of us have a heart, a propensity for a heart to drift, drift towards putting God second maybe in our marriage, putting God second in our, uh, in our uh, aspiration to make more money, in our drive to be more influential, in our, in our ministry, to say, God, this is what you called me to do. This is why I'm doing it. So, uh, but your heart is drifting away from the reality of seeking him first. And maybe social media influence, sports, fashion, whatever it is, Proverbs 3 is saying, in everything you do, you put God first. Sounds to me like it's a worship thing. Beck and I have built this house as a house of worship. That we are in a place where that's the reason why we press into worship together longer than 10 minutes, longer than 30 minutes, sometimes 40, sometimes longer, is because we, we came to the place that this is why we are alive. This is our supreme high calling, is to be a worshiper, to worship God, to give him the utmost of value, to express worship unto God, that he is the worthy one. This is our response. Why? Because the Lord in his mercy designed you and I in our fullest expression in life to stand before him being accepted, delighted, and ministering unto God. So first and foremost, our ministry must be that if we we are to put everything first, God first, that our ministry is unto the Lord first and foremost. You see, the Bible talks about uh, in John, it says, God is looking to and fro across the earth, not for worship, he's looking for worshipers. He's worth looking for worshipers because why? Because every decision, every thought out of God's head, every ambition, every plan, every decision, everything has always been 100% motivated by love. 
It's a sense of the creator being worshiped by the, the creation and he wants this relationship with us. That's why he has put things in the word of God because love knows best. Everything that he has spoken to us should have a response from you and I. You and I. In Exodus 19, the Lord prophesies over the people of Israel. He says, you shall be priests unto the Lord. Leviticus 61, you shall be priests unto the Lord. Peter, in 1 Peter, then wraps it up in a bow and he says, now you are a royal priesthood. You are in this moment with your entirety, your body, your mind, your fiscal appetites, your, your, your aspirations, your personalities, your gifts, your everything. Everything was designed to equip us to be effective worshipers. Everything about us is a ministry unto the Lord first and foremost. Can I declare over your life today that God will not be second. God will not be second. He is first that's why in Exodus, in the Old Testament, he says, you must not have any other God before me. That sounds like he's pretty serious. Exodus 20 goes on to say he's a jealous God, that he wants to be numero uno. There's a reason why. Then we, we, we go into the New Testament, and Jesus says in Matthew 22, 37, he says, you must, you must, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. You must. That, that, you you got to take that as a foot-stomping emphasis you must love the Lord your God. You, you must put him first. It's the principle that we're trying to get past today. It's the principle of first. If you can get the principle of first, that's through, through Genesis and Revelations, the principle of first, everything else in life flows from it. It's a powerful thing. We can be in the midst of war. Jesus said well, there's going to be wars and rumors of war, but yet we can be anchored in peace. Anchored in hope, anchored in the fact that we, have, we can do something about what is happening in this earth right here, right in Loveland, right in Colorado, right in this nation, if together in everything we put God first. That we challenge our lifestyles. We say, God, there, that, that you need to challenge me. Is there any area of my life that I've put you second? Is there any area in life that is stinging your heart, is grieving your heart because I'm so driven that I have to be so uh, enveloped in my business. I have to be so enveloped in this gift or the pursuit of getting straight A's at college. I have to be so over, uh, overthrown. But the, it's the God saying, God, I need you to challenge my heart today. I need you to challenge my heart because every kingdom issue is a heart issue. And throughout the Bible, God, he, he tests us. And I love what Mama Joyce Meyer says. She says that God may test you, but if you fail the test, you're just going to keep taking it over and over and over and over and over again. God had to test Job. There was a sense, there was a teaching moment in it when God tested Job. He, had, he tested the Apostle Paul when the Bible says when he got on the ship, before they shipwrecked, that God created the wind. Why would God create the wind? There was a test. Think about this. God tested me in 2001. I moved to Australia, and he tested my heart because I, I all of a sudden became impassioned for worship, impassioned to lead worship, impassioned for the electric guitar, impassioned for songwriting. And it was just it's what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be, and I was giving guitar lessons. That's how I was accumulating money at, at, the, at the moment, and, and so God started to test me. So two months went in, was giving lessons to this young guy, and all of a sudden the, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to give your brand new Takamini acoustic guitar to this young man. I'm like, no, God, no, no. No, no. Don't you see? This is what you called me to. This is the dream in my heart, and this is how I'm going to get there. This is my, this is my gift. This is everything. This is my assignment. And God says, no, give it away. Why? Because he was testing my heart. Do you truly love me, or do you love music? Do you truly love me, or do you love the fame that music can bring you? See, I wonder if God has tested you recently. I wonder if God has tested you, like, God, why are you allowing this, this thorn in my side? Why are you allowing this mountain to climb? Why are you asking me to surrender this thing in my life? And we got to come back to the very fact that we are worshipers, worshiping a God that is 100% motivated by love because he is love, and he would not let anything happen in your life if it wasn't for a reason. Everything that you're going through right now, it's for a reason. But God is saying to you and I today, God will not be second. It goes on to say in Proverbs, it says 9 to 10, it says, Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Oh, 
income means money. The church doesn't talk about money. Are we going to talk about money today, Pastor Aaron? I think we're going to talk about money today, church. The Bible talks about faith 500 times. The Bible talks about prayer 500 times. The Bible also talks about money. Jesus talks about money 2,000 times. If our Lord and Savior talks about money, the church needs to talk about money. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income. What does that mean? Maybe you are new to Christendom. Maybe you, uh, maybe you are a seasoned Christian, but you never started to explore what God talks about when he's talking about the tithe. The Old Testament called it first fruits or the tithe. The Hebrew word was mahazer, which means one-tenth. It means it's an act of worship and obedience that we return one-tenth of our finances back to God. It doesn't say that we just give to God. No, it says we return what already belongs to God, declaring that you are my provider. I acknowledge this belongs to you. Everything I have is yours, and this is my first fruit. Can I say that tithing is a test? Tithing is a test. Generosity is a test in our lives. Whether it's tithe, whether it's giving above and beyond, whether it's saying, God, this is a large lump sum of money, I'm going to give it. Which, by the way, someone so generously gave $27,000 to our building campaign last week. (laughs) Phenomenal. But hear me, lean in, tune in. Don't tune out, tune in to what God is saying. See, see, because uh, I remember when Beck and I gave River our first $20 bill, her first $20 bill, and we gave her this 20, and uh, we gave her 10, five, and five ones, and we now said, hey, River, $2 of that goes back to the, to, the, to the storehouse, goes back to God, goes back to the church, and she grips the money, and she goes, no, I got exactly what I need to get my toy that I wanted, and a lot of us in our childlike faith don't step past the point of, yes, it takes faith. It's a testing. But can I say this? I mean, we've got to stop arguing with the God of the universe about 10%. When the God of the universe gave his one and only begotten son, his name is Jesus Christ. If he exemplified all, then we can come to a place of God. 10% uh, 10 represents testing. How many plagues in Egypt? There was 10 that means the Pharaoh's heart was challenged and tested 10 times. How many commandments? It means there's 10. Jacob's wages changed 10 times. Daniel was tested for 10 days. The virgins in Matthew 25, five. Five foolish, five wise equals 10. How many days of testing? Revelations 2, 10. There was 10 days of testing. How many disciples? No, I'm, just, I'm just testing you. <laughs> Some of you are like, 10! (laughs) Got it. But Pastor Aaron, tithing's in the Old Testament. It's 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 an argument worth having. It's a conversation worth having. It's a a studious uh, approach and adventure to go on to say, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay. If if you're saying that... Uh, the tithing just remains in the Old Testament and doesn't go and it's not ratified by Jesus in the New Testament. That means, that means under the law, anything even bad under the law is now good and able to do under the, the law of grace. So in other words, adultery, stealing, if it was, it was commanded not to do in the Old Testament, that you're saying that I can now do it in the New Testament? Do you guys... Hear what I'm saying? It's, it's, we're not saved by the law, but it's a principle that God wants to teach us. And even in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, hey, be educated by what happened in the, New, or the Old Testament. Don't just shove it off. Don't just say I'm a New Testament person. I'm just a Jesus movement person. No, it's, it's in the sense that, hold on, even Moses, the idea of the concept of tithe didn't start with Moses. It started 500 years earlier with our father of the faith, Abraham. He's the one. He is the gift of faith. It came from Abraham. He's the one that ushered this in. And you and I have been adopted. And it says we are a part of the father of our faith, who is Abraham. So the difference between law and grace is law equals requires. Grace equals enables. Grace is now enabling you to fulfill what Jesus has commanded you. And there's a sense, there's a quote that says this, your tithe is your rent payment for living on his planet, breathing in his air, and you don't want to get evicted. 
Let me go deeper. Can I go deeper? Uh, Exodus 13, 2 says this. Dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites. The first offspring to be born of both humans and animals belongs to me. So here God starts to, to, to sow the word belonging, a sense of ownership, that this, is, this actually belongs to me. This is not for you to give. This is used for you to return. God gave the firstborn, the the lamb of God. He didn't, the, the lamb, he didn't wait for, you know, the 10th lamb that was the ugliest lamb. Uh, Exodus 13, 13, it says this, a firstborn donkey may be bought back by the Lord by presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. So a lot of this terminology can get so confusing and over your head. But what does this mean? It's basically simply saying animals are either clean or unclean. And in this case, the lamb is considered clean. The donkey is unclean. The unclean donkey is used as a sacrifice to redeem, purchased with a clean lamb. So in other words, let me ask you this question. Were you brought into this world clean or unclean? You were brought into this world unclean. We were brought into this world through the sinful nature. We needed to be purchased by a spotless lamb. Who is Jesus to God? He was the firstborn. Jesus is the son of God, the lamb of God. Jesus was clean. He never, ever, ever sinned. And how did God give? He didn't hold back. He gave his firstborn, his only one and only son. He gave the clean lamb of God without spot or with blemish. Why? To redeem you and I of our sins. So you gotta understand that God didn't say, hey, I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, I'm just gonna wait for humanity to get, uh, get it right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for you to get religious and, and, and get it all together and stop smoking weed and stop doing this and stop watching that. I'm, uh, once you get it all together, then fine. Then I'll send my one and only begotten son. No, God gave his first and bet, best. And while we were yet sinners, this is the God that we serve. It takes faith to give your first and best. And even in Malachi, we're not going to go to the scripture, but go read it. In Malachi, it says, test me. This is the only time in scripture where God says, test me. Test me in everything you do. Put me first, but test me and watch that I don't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. Test me. Watch and see what I do in your life. Malachi goes on to say, at the very beginning of Malachi, it, it says that the Lord does not change. And it says, don't rob me. Don't rob me of what you're to bring in the storehouse. Don't rob me. But if you do, if you test me, this is what is going to take place in your life. And now, this is not preaching prosperity gospel. Let me just tell you that. This is not trying to, 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 to teach you a principle that if I do this, I'm going to have a Ferrari in two weeks. This is a sense of, this is a holy, God-fearing command in the Bible that I have been implementing in my life, Becky, in her life, our, our family's life, that we have we've seen time and time again the reward and the blessing of God, of us adhering to what God has said. Let me go deeper. Luke 16, 9 says this. Luke 16, 9. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Verse 11, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust, who will commit to your trust the true riches, question mark. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the question is, what is mammon? A lot of us, if you've been in the church world for a while, have been walking with Jesus, obviously, yeah, mammon is money. I get it, mammon is money. And if if you go to some of the paraphrase translations of the, of, the, of the scripture, you'll start to break it down, and they actually use, uh, you cannot serve God and money. But uh, if we break this down, let me just say, mammon is an Aramaic word, which means riches. And it comes from the Assyrian God of riches. So mammon is not money. Mammon is a spirit. Mammon is a deity, a false deity, a demon, a principality that calls himself the spirit of mammon. If we can put some of those uh, pictures on the screen. 
So this is the Egyptian version of the spirit of mammon. The Egyptians had over 2,000 gods that they would worship and they would serve. This is the Egyptian god of the spirit of mammon. The next one. This is someone, uh, if you can't quite see it, it's, it's a someone on a throne and he has a bag of money. And this is someone coming in, offering their life to the spirit of mammon. The next one. This is another king. He's on his right hand. He has his hand on a woman's head. And his left foot is on the back of a man, basically holding them in bondage to their wealth and their possessions. That's what it exemplifies. See, in this moment where the Assyrians, they had eight deities that they worshipped. Eight deities. And the number one deity was the Assyrian god, the god of riches. Uh, Assyrian families. If they, had, uh, if they uh, had too many kids and they couldn't financially provide for their kids, they would take one of their children, sacrifice it to the, go- the Assyrian god of riches in order to be financially blessed. And these Assyrians uh, got this god from uh, being held captive in Babylon for 70 years. And this is where you have to do your study, church. This is where you have to break down words. This is you have to understand uh, the Hebrew. You have to understand the Greek. You have to be studious because uh, if, you, if you break down the word Babylon, where does it come from? A lot of us don't know where the word Babylon comes from. It comes from the Tower of Babel. In that moment and in that day, it comes from the Tower of Babel. And you know that story. This is when, they, when, the, when all the men united and they started to build a, a tower to reach heaven because they thought they could do it without God. And if you break down the word Babylon, so the first word is Babel. So if you say it really slow, Babel, you know, like our president does. He does a lot of babbling. Um, but if you, if, you, if you break down the word, check it out. Babel actually means confusion. Babel on, if you add the suffix, uh, Babel on means sown in confusion. Sown in confusion. We can, we, can, we can erect a tower to get to heaven because we have our own energy, our own uh, uh, money, our own influence. We can do this. We can do it without God. This is the spirit of, of mammon saying, I don't need God. I'm arrogant, prideful spirit that tries to replace God and tries to present myself as someone that does something that God set promises and that he will do. But, but the spirit of mammon cannot do anything that God cannot do. He cannot give you love. He cannot give you peace. He cannot give you victory. And no, the spirit of mammon wants to try to do that. And guess what? He's looking for servants. This is a spirit that wants to rule your life. And Jesus is very clear. He's saying you cannot serve both God and mammon. It's not talking about money. He's not putting, well, it says unrighteous mammon. He's not saying money is unrighteous. A lot of us think, oh, money is unrighteous. No, he's trying to show to you that that the spirit of mammon is a spirit that's trying to replace God in your life if you cannot fulfill the commands that God has put in place for you to put to keep at bay that spirit. And let let me just open your thinking more. The spirit of mammon is the spirit of the Antichrist. Think about this. The spirit of the Antichrist, who is on the earth today, who will one day, the Antichrist, one day reign in Israel and fulfill the seven years of tribulation, the whole thing. But the spirit of Antichrist does not rule through the threat of nuclear war. The spirit of Antichrist rules through the threat of not being able to buy and sell. If you don't bow to me, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you won't be able to provide for your family. It's very real. There is a spirit at work in our lives. And the spirit of mammon, if you just have more money, you might have more significance. If you just have more money and the right credit cards and the right clothes and the right car and the right house, if you just had more money, you'll just be happier. Ask any millionaire, ask any billionaire. I'm telling you, they cannot find happiness in wealth. If I just had more money, I'd have a better marriage. If I just had more money, I could help more people. Listen very carefully. Money is not the answer to help someone at the root of why they need to be helped. Only Jesus Christ can totally Totally rescue, heal, save, and deliver. God uses money and has its place. And the thing is this, is that Jesus, 
didn't go around and the blind uh, Bartimaeus asked him, hey, please heal me, open my eyes. Jesus didn't go, hey, you need more money. This is your answer. This is, this is what's gonna fix your problem. Let me ask you this question. Um, have you ever had this thought? Like you're in a desperate mo- uh, a time with money and you say, I either need God to come through right now or I need someone to give me some money. Because if someone would give me some money, God, don't, don't worry about it. I'll stop my praying. I don't, I don't, I don't need you anymore. That is the deception of the spirit of mammon coming in. I don't care where you are, affluency, uh, uh, wealth-wise, doesn't matter. You have to come to a place of honoring God with your first and with your best. The spirit of mammon is a spirit. And so, is money evil? Everybody says, is money evil? The Bible says, it's, it's not... Uh, what does it say? The Bible doesn't say the root of all evil is money. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. See, money is neutral. Money can be used for good. Money can be used for bad. See, it's the sense that I think what Jesus is saying here is loving and serving the spirit of mammon is the root of all evil. That you determine in your life, you determine in your life, am I going to redeem the 90% of my finances by bringing my 10% to the storehouse? Am I gonna redeem it by bringing it back to God and saying, God, I need your blessing. I need your blessing upon this. I don't want to rob from you. I don't wanna uh, take from you because God, I know that you are my provision. You're my Jehovah Jireh in this moment and in this hour, I will not serve the spirit of mammon. Verse nine, Luke 69, if I could have Joe out. Go back to Luke 16, nine, it says this. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. But when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. What does that mean? When you make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon? See, when, when you think it's money, you think, oh, yeah. I, I don't, don't make friends with money. And, you, and when you fail, that I don't, I don't understand what the rest of that means. So what he's saying here is this. If the unrighteous mammon... The unrighteous spirit of mammon, if I take this unrighteous mammon and redeem it by giving it my first and the best to the house of God and allowing God to use this money to, to come against what Satan was trying to do and use it for good to build the kingdom of God, we will see people get saved. We will see. They will become your friends. What does that mean? Brothers, they'll become your brothers and sisters in Christ. When you fail, the word fail, broken down, means die. When you are physically non-existent, there will be people in heaven that, that welcome you, that said, because of your generosity, because of your blessing, because of your dedication to the house of God, my life was reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of your offering to the missionary in Africa, because of your offering to the orphan is in Thailand because of your offering to Cambodia and those that are being sex trafficked you are making an eternal difference and people it says they may receive you into an everlasting home Jesus is it's profound it's exciting it's incredible and it goes on to say it goes on to say therefore you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon Who will commit to your trust the true riches? What is he talking about? The true riches is the person to your right, the person to your left. True riches is not in possessions. In a blink of an eye, Israel was starting to be attacked. In a blink of an eye, a group of people that were at a rave, all of a sudden parachuters came down and started shooting everybody. In a blink of an eye, everything changes. But what doesn't change is eternal souls is the souls in this room, the people in our world that are are, are either on a trajectory to hell or a trajectory to heaven. And this is saying, God's saying, this, man, because of your offering, heaven is being populated and hell is being plundered. Because of your goodness, we can reach more people. It's not about a mega church. It's not, it's not, if you, if you, if you come to City Point and you don't trust this house, go find a house that you trust with your 10%. It's not about that. This is an incredibly generous church. 
But this is about the Word of God coming alive in our heart. And let's see a revelation that our offerings are powerful. That our generosity can open up the door for souls to be one to the kingdom of God. Proverbs 3, 6. In everything you do, put God first. And He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. And the beautiful thing is this. When you put God first, He never lets you go without. Let me tell you this. I've put him to the test time and time again. I'll be honest and vulnerable. All my walk with Jesus, the 23 years, there's been times where some months I didn't tithe because it got really bad. Some months I didn't, but because I'm now under the law of grace, God's not a big cop in the sky slapping my hand with a ruler. It's a worship. It's unto God. It's, a, it's an offering that I continue to bring unto him. In everything I do, I will put you first. But he's, he declares reward right here. I'm going to crown your efforts with success. Don't be conceited, sure of your own wisdom. Instead, trust and reverence the Lord and turn your back on evil. And when you do that, then you will be given renewed health and vitality. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income. And what? He will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Let me tell you, once you settle this principle in your life, you now open the floodgates and, 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 and step into the invitation of breakthrough and increase. He's interested. That's why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things things. He knows exactly what you need and when you need it. Can we put our hands towards heaven? Father, right now in the, in the name of Jesus, I break and I bind the spirit of mammon in this place. I break and bind the spirit of that is trying to, to oppress us, keeping us from breakthrough, keeping us from increase. Not just the increase of, of, of money, but the increase of joy, peace, fulfillment. The closeness of, of walking with Jesus, obeying Jesus. So Father, we break and we bind that spirit. You have no more room in any heart, no more room in any minds. Today we put our, our foot down and we say no more. Father, we bring you the, the, we, any unbelief in our hearts, any tension when it comes, Lord, to, to, to this, this, the scriptures on, on tithing or money. Lord, let us, let us lay it at the altar today. Let us lay it at the altar and you bring revelation. You bring peace. You bring direction. You bring the, 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 the faith and the passion to rise up and start to say yes to you. I'm only the messenger. You are the divine operator. So Father, let every heart in this place be encouraged, uplifted. And Father, as we move into a, a, a scary unknown season of our economy, that Lord, despite the threats, despite the, the lies, the fears, the things we see on the, on the news or social media, despite all that, your word says, your word says, so I declare kingdom increase in this place. I declare kingdom multiplication in this place. I declare, God, that you will, you will take businesses, Lord, as, as, they, as in everything and put you first. As they put you first, I declare businesses in this place will start to erupt with more than enough business that they have to, they're going to have to turn people away. More than enough entrepreneurial ideas, ideas that will just explode and break through in, in, in different uh, uh, arenas of, of, of life, in, in different arenas of the seven mountains, God. You're raising up a generation, God, to say yes to you, but to advance every, every idea that he's yet, yet, not yet birthed on this earth, to see more souls come to Jesus. Lord, let this revelation sink let it transform, let it challenge, and let it change. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. With every eye looking at me, from the front to the back, left to the right, in the upper room, online, 
right now in this moment, we must conclude with this, with this invitation. My friend, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? If I was to confront you face to face, could you tell me beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven? Do you know, have you tasted the love and the goodness of his forgiveness? Have you felt it? Today, my friends, he's knocking on the door of your heart and he wants you to, to know in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's not just one of the gods. He's just not a best friend that we sing about. No, he is Lord, master, and savior of your life. The Bible says he died on the cross for our sin and for our shame. Every single one of us all fall short of the glory of God. But yet the Father saw humanity and with love said, I'm gonna send my son to redeem us. He died on the cross. Three days later, he rose again, defeating death, defeating sin, and now giving you an opportunity to receive the gift of salvation. On the count of three, if that's you, online, in the upper room, or in this room, from my left, from my left to right, if that's you, just raise your hand and say, yes, Pastor, and please pray with me today. One, two, three. If that's you in this room, bold leaders, raise your hand, saying yes. From my right to your left, online, make a comment upper room. We have leaders in there. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Father, we thank you so much. Today, we declare you will not be second in any area of our lives. And we declare, Lord, in everything that we do, we will put you first. In Jesus' mighty name. Can we give God a shout of praise in this place?